there first. So that's the envelope, and we're part of the contents. Poetry has a value, and then, too, there are a lot of people who don't understand the importance of hearing someone read their own work aloud. Like what Ed said, there really is a connection. Um, as great, or sometimes greater, a connection as the, the connection when you have the book in front of you and read it yourself, and something, something clicks because it's wonderful. Um, I think one of, one of the readings this year that everybody tr really, truly felt the strongest about was the reading of Ed, uh, Kim Rosenfield, and John Miller. P partly because um, Ed and Kim you know, had come through the organization in different ways, but had been around for a while. Their work had developed, and over a period of a year or two, had developed you know, to really an astonishing level. And to have that reading was like a confirmation that the whole system works, that everything that we do here does connect, and that it works. And um, it, was, it was really satisfying. I remember Dennis standing out in the hall and said he felt like a parent. Uh, it was amazing. It was all those. How many, do you know what Cole on her book she published? That's not counting Little Caesar magazine. No, 21 books. Since, since when? When did you start publishing? Since 78. The first book came out in 78? Yeah. That's an amazing album. What, really, huh? Well, I don't know. For a small press? A lot of it's this Please. year. I mean, you look at it, how about the list? It becomes 1982. But see, there's a whole group of poets who I particularly respond to who are like around, based around Beyond Baroque, sort of. And, and mostly younger than all of them, younger in their era. I mean, they're like sort of the center of things, I think, mm -hmm. because Beyond Broke necessarily is at the center of things because it's got the money and it's got the best series and it's got the reputation and things. And, and they're the best. I mean, they're just they're really working hard. They want they don't want to just confess their sins on paper. They want to like make art, you know. And so this, so immediately they've captured sort of this spotlight. I like to make beautiful books. I like to make books that look great, that are that are fun to read. That's another reason. Um, I like to I like to help people who are really good. You know, make careers for themselves or help their careers along. Why? I help people I know find good work. Why? Because I, I happen to be lucky enough to be in this position where people care about what I publish and and these people are really good and, and I got the opportunity to do it and I do it and as simple as that. You know, I mean, it's just, they're just really, you know, I mean, they're just, they're the best. I mean, they're the best around as far as I'm concerned. Well, I don't mean, what do you think know. of your own ambitions in terms of this? What do I think of my own ambitions? Yeah. Do you think of yourself as really ambitious? I think in context I am, just because there's so few other people doing it. I mean, it's a publisher, yeah. I think in context, I guess I am. Yeah, people tell me I am, and, and nobody else seems to be doing much. I mean, publishing ten books in one year when, you know, nobody else seems to be publishing anything, I guess is sort of ambitious. Are you going to publish ten books every year? No. Uh, it's too much work. It's not. I mean, the books don't get the kind of attention. Each book doesn't get the kind of individual attention it should get when I do that. So, what is it? Does it just sort of accelerate? I mean, you're working on one, and you see other work you like, and yeah. you sort of. It's so easy just to say, "Oh, look, this looks great. I'd love to publish this." I do that all the time. I just, I just see someone, someone's work I want to publish, and I say, "Let me publish you." And I don't think, I don't think that, you know, geez, this is going to be a lot of work. I just think, "God, oh, it'd be really great to publish this person and get them out." There, so. But you know, I, I know I've got to stop. I've got to cut it down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't want to do more, no more than five a year now. From now on, I can't get the magazine. It's been a magazine takes forever to get out now because I got so many books I have to publish. And the, I love the magazine. I love doing it. It's my favorite thing to do. Yeah. For the magazine, I have this thing in the first issue. It's like really, it's like uh, can I read this thing? Yeah, it's no, really, please, it's, yeah. it's very. Um, let me just read. Let me just read this thing to you. This is like when I started. This is our my Jim Glazer and I's manifesto. It's like this is what Little Caesar was supposed to be. And it's, I and love it's, it's, it's all sort of He's <laughs> so cool. It's all sort of <laughs> this is a. I think there are already too many little magazines around, mostly uninteresting and virtually unread. So why are Jim and I adding this to the heap? Maybe we're crazy, but we think there can be a literary journal that's loved and powerful. We want a magazine that's read by the poetry fans, the rock culture, the Hardy Christmas, the Dodgers. <laughs> we think it can be done, and that's what we're aiming at. I have this dream where writers are mobbed everywhere they go, like rock stars and actors. A predilection? You never know. People like Patti Smith, poet rock star. 
are suddenly forcing their growing audiences to become literate, introducing the Rambo, Breton, Burroughs, and others. Poetry sales are higher than they've been in 15 years. Oh, that was a total lie. In Paris, 10-year-old boys, in Paris, 10-year-old boys clutching well-worn copies of Apollinaire's Al Cools put their hands over their mouths in amazement for paintings by Renoir and Monet. I saw one boy in Paris do that. Bruce Lee films close in three days. This could happen here. Gosh, see now, uh, I mean, Bruce Lee films seem better than Ron Renoir films. Man, goodness. Let us introduce ourselves. We're not 50-year-old patrons of the arts. We're young punks just like you. And just because Ken Rexroth's got a name in the sun cross doesn't mean a wink's gonna get his rickety old crap in here. He comes to the back room just like everybody else. <laughs> we need your support in your art. We're looking for everything from poetry to fiction to musical scores to cartoons to porno. Please forgive little Caesar while we're in our toddler stage and stick with us. We could be on fire. I mean, you know, youthful idealism at its peak. Did you write now, I just, now I just want to make, I basically just want to have a magazine that's, that publishes like the best work there is and, and sort of like gets it to a wider audience than the usual poetry audience, which is sort of the same idea, but it's, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't have any. I have no. I'm not going to get a whole lot of Dodger fans to read the magazine now, and so I'm sort of give it. I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying for that broad an appeal. I'm trying to do something that's really good and, and keep an eye on different aspects and try to get so it has, it has um, you know, so a lot of people want to read it. Some pretty well. I mean, a lot of people read Little Caesar don't seem to be. I mean, have seen enough uh, interested in poetry. They just like it because it's, you know, it's energy or something. They like the general feel. When I was in Paris, I used to go into this little cafe and talk with this old man who was just, just some sort of worker, and he knew all of Blaise Sandra's poetry by heart. Wow. It's just incredible. Yeah, that would happen there, it wouldn't happen here. It would never happen here. Yeah. It's probably a few, few jerks that know Dylan Thomas's you know, works by heart or something. But... I bet nobody knows Walt Whitman by heart. No, I know there's a, a friend of mine, uh, my friend Tim Miller, who's a performance artist in New York, has a friend who's a dancer who knows almost all, knows like a whole whole sections of John Ashbery by heart. He dances well, the net while well reciting John Ashbery. What's his name? Um, John. Uh, God, he's, yeah, I don't remember. He's incredibly beautiful. He's a so incredibly beautiful boy that came. Tim wanted to and had him come to my reading because he thought I thought I'd really like him, and he came to my reading and hated my work, just hated it. So I took care of that. By uh, John, uh, I'm going to read the last section of this piece called My Mark, and um, it's, it's the first part of this three or four part piece I'm working on now, sort of a prose piece, prose poem, and uh, it came out of, the impulse came out of this frustration I had over this person, Mark Lewis, and my, in my dealings with him, um, which were they were very frustrating. I was dazzled by him, and I had a really typical, typical time getting through to him, the, making that seem like that was interesting or important to him at all. And um, and I just maybe started maybe sort to think about the kind of people I got, was getting involved with in general, and also made me think about the way my attitude was toward my work and the way my that my work was like Mark Lewis in a way. What I was trying to do, my work was trying to get to this beautiful, implacable, arrogant creepy surface or something like that, to, to, to the feeling inside or something, that he was like my work. So I wrote this piece called My Mark, which is about him and the relationship, but it's also about my work, my mark on the page. And it's also my, you know, it, there's a lot of levels on which I think it works. Anyway, it's, it's, it, it's about him and the relationship with him. And then I'm going to read the last part of it, which is after I've sort of gone through this thing with him and he's, I'm no longer involved with him. And he's sort of faded away, he's become sort of a hallucination or something. This is the piece that's the last one. Yeah. So this is from my mark. And the, the whole piece is dedicated to um, Tim Miller, who's my friend. A friend. I'm here alone. Mark is in Washington, D.C. Craig is in Downey. Julian's in Paris. Robert, David, and Sean are at work. They were my lovers. Now they sound more like the names you hear paged in an airport and sort of wonder about. All the fingers on my hands extended mean presto changeo, which, aimed at somebody important, can't make him love you, but used on Mark's shoulders, seem to relax him a little. There's an odor inside the body I can't figure out. Unlike crotches, and worse than the ass's reminder of brunch, snack, or dinner. I read about it in novels. 
the madman poised over an innocent victim, his knife at the end of its trudge down the teenager's chest, which, like the earth in some scared Californian's opinions, splits open upon the least provocation. The murderer, thinking of rummaging inside the torso, is driven back by a frightening stink, which writers leave in obscurity, stumped as to how to describe it, not having smelled it. Without it, Mark's not complete, but it lies slightly out of my grasp, like the big ring of keys to the door of the jail cell, where somebody somewhere is probably locked up for strangling some kid he couldn't get love from. He'll reach as far as he can to the bars and never get near it. I mean the truth about anyone. Mark's still a mystery to me. He was in part a young man who happened to wind up with well-balanced features, knew what to do with his eyes, and I exaggerated his power as it was a time in my life when I needed to feel very strongly. Mark filled the bill. Seeing his face on first meeting, I was so speechless that friends had to turn me around and shake my shoulders. When I was younger and met a boy who I wanted to sleep with, I was too embarrassed to say so. I'd lie there thinking, I'd lie there wishing that he was in trouble or dying so that my feelings about him were justified, and then I could say it to him on his deathbed, it being, I'll always love you, and he would die thinking of me. Now I'm too embarrassed to think of the people I care about dead, and those who I love may as well be starring in their lives around me, and I one of tons of admirers breezing by. Once Mark took me to a magic show. I was called onto the stage to assist a magician. I was amazed by how phony his sparkling tubes looked. He pulled something out of my ear. I felt stupid, was famous for weeks in a vague way. We saw a man with a partially paralyzed face there who did some pretty good card tricks, but all the magic of them was destroyed by having to watch him perform. Later we heard he had died. I miss Mark. I aimed my feelings right at him. He moved back to Georgia, left no address or phone number, and was lying nude in the dark listening to music the last time I heard from him. I loved him. I should have said so less often. It got so his eyes wouldn't register that kind of input. He'd lie there thinking of something or somebody so far away that he seemed dead, and I'd have to rub his skin like a frostbite victim's until he knew I was home. That's an exaggeration. This is a time when independence seems important. I keep my guard up. I've got a dim trace of wit where my heart would be turned up full volume and pointed at someone. I have less sex with more people. I should just say things are okay, I guess, like I would if questioned by cops about it. Once they impressed me, but so did the bullies who hit me with math books and left me prone on the ground. My father found me asleep at my train set and carried me up to my bed. Wake up, Mark yelled at me. Look around you, get your fucking life into gear. My life was great and that wasn't what he was trying to say. He'd walk around in the evening slamming doors rather than say what he meant, which is what I had asked for. I was probably drunk, hoping I'd die or he'd stop me, one or the other. I couldn't speak my mind either so I emptied a fifth of tequila in it. I have a photograph of Mark and me up against the, a white wall which could be anywhere in the world. We look incredibly happy in it, having been drunk on our asses seconds before. We have our arms around each other's shoulders. I'm more ecstatic than Mark is, and he's more determined to look great on paper. It was a luminous moment. My line to friends upon showing it to them is, we would have made some great babies together. Their eyes roll upward. In blindness that touches perfection, a hearse is like anything else. Ian Curtis wrote that. He sang with a rock band called Joy Division. Hearing him sing such things in his deep, quavering voice, I had the sense that he couldn't get close to his feelings, and his embarrassed attempts were the subject of what he was doing. He killed himself before getting respect for that. I knew this would happen. I remember the first day I met him, he said, Hi, my name is Richie White. I'm on probation. I saw that line from a movie because what the young boy pronouncing it really wanted to say was, I liked him. He felt too stunned to. The fellow named had been shot by police when he pulled out an unloaded pistol. Richie was brown haired, brown eyed, smooth skinned, and bored, then he rotted away in the ground. His friends set fire to their school to feel better. I'm trying to get to the truth just like they were, so that even when looking into the eyes of somebody who doesn't care about me any longer, or never did, I'll be strong. Mark used to make me seem helpless. Back then I wrote in my journal, when I'm with him I feel perfectly calm, and when I'm not I want to jump off a building so he'll never stop thinking of me. Now I've added in a steadier hand. I couldn't have meant that. Certain things mean a great deal to me. Mark did. My father does. Sex does. Being a friend to a great person does. So does the knowledge that I'm alone, although praised at the hilt by some people. 
even when loved so intently, I don't have to think about concepts like love any longer, which I've never been, nor would have realized if I was, which doesn't matter or, is, or has been hopelessly screwed up by me and won't come back. Once I held high hopes. I'd loved Mark, found that emotion was possible. He was a small human shape climbing into a car at the end of the driveway. I knew that he'd become much less important to me, but there I was writing a letter so he'd at least understand things a little. He called me up when he got it, and we talked for hours, and when there was nothing but awkward silence left, he said, then let this be it, okay? Promise me. I promised. 